This is a Roland SH32, a fairly unloved synthesizer from the early 2000s. Today we're going to look at how to make it sound as much as possible like a Juno series, some of the best loved synthesizers from the early 1980s. So the SH32 is uh, a wavetable synth. In other words, it does not, it's not a virtual analog synth. It uh, has samples for the waveforms, and then it passes those through digital filters. There's nothing analog about it. Benefit of this is that it can be multi-timbral. It has up to four independent voices um, with 32 total uh, voices in polyphony that can be split among those four parts. Its architecture is uh, something like the Jupiter series, maybe. It has two oscillators, a filter, two independent LFOs, and an amp section. So the challenge is going to be uh, replicating the Juno's architecture, which is one oscillator with several switchable waveforms, one envelope that's shared between the filter amplifier, and one, FL one LFO, uh, which can be routed or, or set to affect different sections um, in different amounts. So what we'll do is we'll start out with uh, one of the uh, terrible factory patches on this synthesizer. Let's do... Yeah, something like that. So very early 2000s. So I'm just going to walk through how to create an initialized patch that would be something like you would get um, by setting your Juno to an initialized patch. So the first thing we want to do is to set our settings over here. We want to make sure that we're not affecting, we're not having MIDI, MIDI velocity affect anything. So not amp level, not amp attack, definitely not cut off, not filter attack, because the Juno is not velocity sensitive. So we wanna remove all of that. We can leave the mod section alone pitch bend is okay, and we can take away aftertouch because there was no aftertouch on the Juno either. That takes care of that. Moving over to the oscillators. So the SH32 has more waveforms than were supported uh, by the Juno. The Juno supports a saw, a square, uh, which can be uh, pulse width modulated either manually uh, or via the LFO. and it did not feature a triangle wave, a spectrum wave. It did feature a noise wave, but we're not going to look at that. I don't think too many people really use the, the noise uh, function on their Juno. So let's start with oscillator one. I'm just going to uh, press that. So we're gonna have it set to a sawtooth. Now within the SH32, you can have different waveforms for each of these. Uh, waveforms, <laughs> different variations. We're going to stick with one for the saw, as that seems to be uh, the closest to what a, a Juno sawtooth would be. And we are going to turn off uh, any sort of octave or sub oscillator for now. We're going to keep the pitch uh, at uh, zero, zero that the, the pitch adjustment out. Um, and we're going to, for this oscillator one, set the uh, pulse width modulation off. Turn that sub oscillator off. So a, a lot of these controls you just won't use. So we're going to ignore the pitch envelope, set, set this both to zero. Uh, we'll have no pitch envelope depth. And we'll, we'll just treat oscillator one as our sawtooth oscillator. If I move over to oscillator two, I'm gonna just solo that. Again, I'm gonna turn off the sub oscillator. I'm going to set this one to a uh, pulse wave. And for the variation there, I'll set that to two. So I'll put a link to a document that goes over my um, suggested settings to clo more most closely mimic the, uh, the Juno. So I found that waves from two to nine are good for the uh, pulse width. Um, if you're going to use uh, the square wave, uh, four seems like a good option. And then the uh, the LFO pulse width modulation doesn't have any variations. So for now, we're going to go back to just the uh, just the pulse width. Again, we'll uh, we'll zero all these out. 
and we'll set the balance equal between one and two. All right, so our filter, we wanna make sure that is set to uh, LPF, low pass filter, and uh, 24 dB per octave. So you can switch this between 12 and 24, but the Juno only had a 24, so we'll leave it there. Turn cutoff all the way up, resonance all the way down. I'll just go ahead and zero out my filter envelope, set depth to nothing. And I'm gonna leave key follow all the way up. Uh, in fact, I've found the SH32 key follow doesn't actually go up as far as the Juno's key follow parameter. And it seems like most Juno patches, this key follow is pretty much cranked. So for the amp, uh, for now, we're going to turn off reverb and delay. We're gonna turn off effects. And I'm going to set just a gate, um, just a gated uh, level here with the sustain all the way up. Moving on to LFO one and two. So the challenge here is that the Juno really only has one LFO. So, but <laughs> that single LFO can actually affect more things at once than these two separate LFOs can. So we'll get into that, but let's just say LFO one, we're gonna zero out the depth. I will set it to affect oscillator one. The form, Juno only had one form, triangle, we like that. Turn off key sync, turn off BPM sync. There was no such thing. Make sure fade in is set to zero. Fade in is the, uh, what would be the delay time on the Juno. And I will shut that off. We'll go over to LFO2 and we'll set this one to, let's say filter. Again, set the form to triangle, turn off BPM sync. And that will turn that off as well, just for our initialized patch. And so that takes care of the LFO. So the last thing and what the trick that the SH32 really has up its sleeve. So as you know, the, the Juno's main uh, claim to fame is its chorus. And it turns out that one of the effects on the SH32 is actually, to my ears, a pretty good, uh, pretty, pretty good duplication of that chorus. So we'll switch insert effects to type and then we will attempt to find HCH, which is hexachorus, um, which I think is the closest thing to the, the Bucket Brigade chorus on the Junos. For color, I'll set that to eight. And again, these are just things that I've played around with. I don't think there's any, you can go too wrong with these settings, just a matter of personal preference. Uh, for depth, I'll go to 0.5 and for level we'll keep that at 10 so I can turn it on and we'll, we'll set the intensity and for the reverb and delay again this doesn't uh, since the the Juno obviously never had reverb or delay that was all outboard but it's always nice to put a little something on the sound if we want to so I'll just set that to a, a room reverb which should hopefully be fairly uh, fairly subtle. Okay, so we should now have, if I go to oscillator one and solo it, we've got a single saw wave, filter, no filter on, and going through just a gate amp, and we should get a very simple sound. Okay, and indeed we do. So what I like to do is save that to uh, a setting to a, a patch slot where I can just always go back to that and refer to it. So, oh, I guess one other thing, I kind of like to put the analog feel at seven. <laughs> this is just supposed to replicate, uh, I guess, oscillator drift, which the Juno, you know, didn't have. It was a digitally controlled oscillator, but it makes it sound a little, I don't know, warmer, something. Okay, so let's just save this. So I'm going to write and I'll choose a, let's say 77 and write it. And yes, I'm sure. Okay. There's my init patch. And I will go to an init patch I created earlier. Sounds the same. Okay, so from here, let's talk about how to get some Juno-esque sounds uh, out of this. So it turns out it's pretty simple. The Juno itself, you know, it was said you could hardly get a bad sound out of it. And I think a lot of that is because um, the controls were very simple and it was hard to do anything bad. So let's just start by uh, working with the, the filter a little bit. I'll turn that down. And I'm 
going to start a sequence going here so we can kind of play with the controls. <laughs> Okay, so that's our that's our filter controls and now of course let's talk about the envelope. So there's two envelopes here. The June only had one. So we need to either make sure that we have these envelope settings both the same. So let's do that. Let's uh and you kind of always would have to do this. So obviously on uh the synthesizer, it's entirely possible to have a separate amp envelope from a filter envelope, but we don't want to do that. Let's start that uh, sequence again and play with the envelope a little bit. Play with the uh, depth a little. something that sounds a little reasonable. Now, of course, what makes a Juno a Juno? It's the chorus. So let's turn on that chorus effect that we added earlier. And bingo. Turn on some reverb. So there's something I'm sure you'll agree it probably not going to sound as good as a Juno, but it's close in idea anyway. So that's a good sound. So that would be the first thing I'd say. Make sure your envelopes either match or you can set um, your amp envelope to be a, a simple gate because the Juno did have a gate switch, uh, which took the envelope out of the equation for the amp. So that's fine too. Other than that though, you just want to make sure that these uh, these match as close as you can and that'll get you in that ballpark. All right, so let's talk about the other oscillator options. Again, there's a document uh, that I'll put in the description which has sort of, <laughs> here's what you're allowed to do and here's what you're not allowed to do. But let's, uh, let's turn off the saw wave and we'll turn on the uh, pulse wave instead. So we can uh, mimic working with the PWM slider on the Juno by selecting this variation. For a pulse width wave, uh, we can go anywhere from two up to nine. So I'll start that sequence again. <laughs> you hear that get a little thicker as we go up. And then of course, if you want to do a full-on square wave, you would just change the waveform here. And I found for the square wave, uh, number four is close. So it's definitely a square wave there. The uh, Juno, of course, also featured a sub-oscillator. And here we're in luck because this sub-oss feature, um, by default, uh, gives you a square wave one octave down, which is perfect. Sounds good. So this sub oscillator is at a fixed volume, whereas the the uh, Juno gave you the ability to to modify that volume. So if you want to play with that, what I would say is turn this fixed uh, sub oscillator off. You can add a sub oscillator. Let's say we want to add it to. Uh, let's go back to a pulse wave here, and let's say we want to add a variable volume uh, sub oscillator. Go back to oscillator one. We'll pick that square wave, which should be variation four again. And we will set this, this octave down. So we're going to set this to be one octave down. Now we can use uh, the, the balance control here to uh, bring in uh, as much sub as we want. 
so that's all the way off, and you can bring it in. And of course, we can have just the sub. So when working with the filter, um, I found that the the range of cutoff is approximates the Juno, at least from what I've heard. I don't actually own one. Uh, the resonance, though, you want to keep that at 50% or under it. This gets really too squelchy for what the Juno could actually do. The other thing this does, it, it will not uh, it will not self oscillate, so you can't do any of that that kind of cool stuff, unfortunately. So th that kind of covers your options for the oscillator, uh, the filter. Uh, and the amp. Let's um, go back. Uh, let's get rid of the sub oscillator here. Go back to just oscillator two. And let's talk about the LFOs. So for oscillator two, let's set that to this PWM waveform which all this is is just this is the only waveform that can take advantage of LF2, <laughs> LF2, LFO2 in this case. So I've set the depth here to zero. So LF, LFO2 on its own won't affect anything, but I can bring in LFO2 via this slider. Turn off the sequencer and just play some uh, chords. So you can kind of hear that PWM going on there. Now we can also, we've got LFO2 affecting this. We can also then have it affect something else. Like uh, we can, let's have it affect the filter as well by turning up the depth. You can kind of hear that bringing the filter in and out. So the, the LFO on the 106 could actually then also affect um, the oscillator as well. These LFOs, can really only affect one thing at once unless you're also working with the PWM. So it's a little annoying if I want to bring in and affect something else, I would have to turn on LFO1. And in that case, just sort of fake it by setting the rate and the depth to the same and have it affect something else. But that's okay. We'll just stick with LFO2 for now. So that kind of covers the LFO section. And as I said, the effects are, you're just gonna stick with that one hexachorus effect, which is nice and we'll stick with that that one reverb. So, I'm just going to play a couple of a uh, couple of their patches that I came up with. Um they're sort of Juno-esque. Play with this one. this and a little bit more of a brass sound So I think you get the idea. Um, so the fun of this is is working with the limitations that you have because the Juno really didn't have very many controls, but you were able to get a lot out of it. Um, one thing which I found interesting to do is to look at some of the original patch sheets, like this is for the Juno 6, and see uh, if I can kind of match the sounds by setting the controls uh, similar to this. So yeah. Um, hope this is of use to someone because um, this synthesizer is goes for about three hundred dollars now. Like I said, not real well regarded, um, but it is multi timbral It is cheap, and it uh, it's a DSP chip, so it's not going to go out on you like uh, like voice chips. And 
I think if nothing else, once you get the hang of programming it as if it was a Juno, it makes it a lot easier to go in and then start taking advantage of some of the other features that it has. So hope you enjoyed. Thanks.